I am very honored to welcome you here tonight to the Rosenmeyer Forum here at Central Lakes College. Um, I always, I never tire of praising the great late senator from Little Falls, who, as you know, was regarded by, not by me only, but by Minnesota historians and political scientists at the University of Minnesota as the greatest state legislator in all of Minnesota history. He was extremely powerful, extremely influential, and enormously respected by everybody. He had unimpeachable integrity. Tonight, it's my distinct honor to introduce to you somebody who doesn't need an introduction. That's Tim Hool. Uh, Tim is, the, is on the Rosenmeyer Board of Directors here. He's also been a longtime county administrator in Morrison County and in Crow Wing County and does a great job, and he's going to introduce the speaker tonight, a job that I normally would do, but due to a cold and uh, some uh, a raspy voice, I'm going to let Tim do the honors of introducing to you Julie Tesh. Thank you, Steve. I'd like to welcome everybody here. For those of you that don't know, the Rosenmeyer Center is a nonpartisan organization. We strive to educate and encourage public participation on public policy questions of the day and try to have forums which are going to bring those public policy questions to you. Uh, and so we will have a presentation tonight from Julie, uh, and then we'll open it up, open the floor to questions. Um, Julie is... Um, is the president and CEO of the Center for Rural Policy and Development. I have the good fortune of sitting on that board of directors representing county government and have been doing that for about 15 years. Seems like a long time. Um, Julie brings, uh, to quote uh, Steve Wenzel, Julie brings a remarkable background of experience and passion for the goal of preserving and improving the quality of life for the people of greater Minnesota. Julie was raised on a small dairy farm near Waldorf, Minnesota, um, and she is a published author and speaker. She grew up on her family's dairy farm in a near Waldorf and was actively involved in 4-H, uh, I presume while you were in school. Uh, after she graduated from the University of Minnesota with degrees in applied economics and an agricultural education, she started her career as a 4-H youth career development uh, specialist with the University of Minnesota and then went on to the National FFA organization in Indianapolis and has worked as the American Farm Bureau Federation Foundation in Washington, D.C. She's been the executive director of all of those organizations. Outside of work, Julie continues to volunteer uh, with FFA and with 4-H. Uh, you can find her in her newfound hobbies of gardening, uh, learning how to do that. We've swapped stories about that and is slowly working towards becoming a certified master gardener. Please join me in welcoming Julie Tesh to the program tonight. Well, thank you, everyone. Let me make sure that this other microphone is on and that the green light is on. Let's see. Green light, green light. There's the green light. Awesome. Thank you for having me tonight. It is an absolute pleasure and honor to be here with the Rosenmeyer Forum. OK, let's work on this. Technology and I don't get along very well. All right. There we go. But thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, I've heard wonderful things about the Rosenmeyer Forum and was very honored to be asked to speak here tonight. I was actually quite surprised um, when I heard that uh, Supreme Court Justice Alan Page was a speaker in the fall. I'm like, OK, I am not Alan Page. But here we are. But um, th again, thank you very much. And thank you to Steve and thank you to Tim. Can you guys hear me OK with this microphone? OK. 
I am not a stand behind the podium person. I will, but I like to walk back and forth. So, future of rural Minnesota. I know that this is a really, really, really broad topic. I've talked with a few people uh, today in town, and they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, oh, the future of rural Minnesota. They're like, can you get more broad? And I'm like, I can, but I can also get a lot more narrow. But so the first question that I always like to ask people when we're talking about rural is what is your rural? When we talk about rural places, what does that mean? To me, I grew up on a farm um, outside of a town of 200 people. That's rural to me. Now, I live close to the town of Mankato. Growing up, I thought that that place was a massive city. When you live in the Twin Cities, you'll look at Mankato and say, that's rural. And Waldorf, where I'm from, is definitely rural. But then when you go out to Washington, D.C., I have plenty of experience where people will say, oh, where are you from? And I'm like, oh, Minnesota. And they think it's all rural. I'm like, have you heard of Minneapolis, St. Paul it, at all? Yeah, that's rural. So it's all in perspective, which is unfortunate. So I always like to begin a presentation with what is your rural? And we'll get into this map in a little bit. So I'm glad that we have um, a really big screen here tonight. But before we get into too much of that, so I'm with the Center for Rural Policy and Development. And like Tim said, he's been on the board for a while. And Steve was our chair for a while. And we were created in 1997 to do research on rural Minnesota policy. That's it. It's the most narrow focused job I've ever had. It's fantastic, but it's also the broadest area of job I've had too. Because rural, eh, it's just agriculture, right? Well, agriculture's part of it, but there's so much more. And so when I talk to people, I like to tell them, I'm like, you know, those of us that live in greater Minnesota, we care just as much about health care, child care, housing, as people in suburban and urban areas. We just look at it in a different way because we have different needs. And so that's what we do with our research is we come at it from a rural angle and try to bring that, that viewpoint from a rural lens. We don't take a side, we don't take positions or anything, but we just give the information and we're a resource for legislators, for county commissioners, for city council members, all of you, anyone that you would like, anyone that would like to use our information, it's all free um, at ruralmn.org. And so please, please go on and use that. So thinking about rural and, you know, when I think of the Brainerd area, this is an area that I think of with Gall Lake, but any, I'm going to ask a quick question. I need audience participation. How many different definitions of rural do you think there are in the federal government? 48. One. One, I wish. 15. 15. Who said 15? Awesome. You, you're about as close as we're going to get. In the federal government, there are over a dozen. Right now, there's about 15. And a lot of them are with the USDA. Some of them are with commerce. So I'm going to show you right now what some of these definitions are. Because one would think there would be one definition of rural, but it's government. Why would there be one? All right, fewer than 50,000 inhabitants and not located adjacent to an urban area. You have to think about that one. Any place outside a town, city, or urban cluster with more than 2,500 residents. Okay. 20,000 or fewer inhabitant, inhabitants, 10,000 or fewer inhabitants, 5,000 or fewer inhabitants, and any place determined by a state government to be rural. And any place that's not in a town or city with more than 2,500 residents. Are you confused? Yes. Me too. And so, again, that's why I always like to ask, what is your rural? How many of you in the Brainerd Lakes area would consider this area uh, a metropolitan area? Raise of hands. Anyone? A little bit? What about a, a rural area? Some more? Or what about a mix? Kind of a mix. OK. Because the crazy thing is, is like Brainerd here, or Mankato from where I'm from in that area, you are five minutes out of town and you're in, you know, whether it's lake country, farm country, woods, 
but that's a mix. But it all depends upon how you define it. And so talking about why does it matter? Who, ca you know, who cares if rural has 15 different, uh, different definitions? Why does it matter? Well, it matters when we make policy. You know, we're real people here in rural Minnesota. And a lot of times, we all know people forget that. We live here, we work here, and it matters. It matters for grants, it matters for schools, it matters for policy. And one of the reasons it matters is, again, depending upon how you look at it, the share of the US population considered rural ranges from 17 to 49%, depending upon how you define it. How are you supposed to make good policy for 17% or 49%? It's difficult. It matters because oversimpl oversimplification ignores the diversity of experiences among rural people. I'm sure you've all heard the, the common, oh, rural is all just a bunch of, uh, you know, Caucasian, white, Eurocentric people living and they're not educated. Well, that's a pretty narrow view, and it's not true. You know, we have a lot of diversity in rural Minnesota, in greater Minnesota, in rural America, and people don't think about that. It's easy to stereotype. And so the oversimplification of rural ignores that diversity. Where do our native nations fit into this? You know, where do our new immigrants fit into this? Here's what's interesting as well, is with the, with the census that happened in 2020, you're now gonna be seeing some communities moving from either urban to rural or rural to urban. And that's going to determine what funds they can apply for at a federal level. And often, I know you hear the diatribe of, oh, rural's dying. Rural is dying, oh gosh, it's just hemorrhaging. I'm sorry, I drove into Brainerd last night and you're not dying. I mean, my God, you have a Costco and a Target, I'm thrilled, you know? I mean, I'm, I'm happy as a clam. Um, but again, I grew up on a t in a town of close to 200. So, but as a side note, I've always said wherever I live, I need to at least be a half hour, within a half hour of a target. So, and I've succeeded at that because I'm a half hour from the main Cato target where I live right now. But population growth in non-metro counties, like here in Crow Wing, is often represented as a decline because many of the fastest growing Non-metro counties have been redefined as metro. So when we talk about the metro area, the Twin Cities, let's talk about the seven county metro area. And then all of a sudden you hear, oh, the 12 county metro area. Well, guess what? Those five counties were probably suburban or maybe rural or a mix before they were metro. So when we're talking about, oh, rural population, people are fleeing, no, they're being recategorized. They're recategorized. They're switching their categories. So thinking about that, yes, is rural population declining? It was until 2020, and we'll get into that here in a little bit. But just thinking about that, it's easy to say rural is dying because it's easy to say. But again, it comes down to how you define it. And probably my favorite thing of why it is important is for rural America today, chronic population decline or depopulation is a product of its own success. Now, what do I mean by that? And is basically, we've done such a good job of bringing people into these regional areas that they're getting reclassified. Again, just like up above. They're no longer these small dying places, they're regional centers or they're, they're growing, but we've done a good job of, of getting people to move to our areas. So it matters. It matters a lot what the definition of rural is. So I wanna encourage you to just think about that. One of the things I'm gonna talk about is how did Minnesota change within the last 10 years with the census? And if my researchers were here, I would let them talk to you about the census. They're on some federal census boards they're the researchers, they are the backbone of our organization and they geek out at all of this. But I'm gonna give you the high level. And you can't, you can't quite, it's a little blurrier than I wanted to, but the dark blue here is what's considered urban. Kind of the lighter blue is a large town, small town is green, rural is yellow, and this is by county, or actually it's by 
population block. So when you take a look at that, you can basically see from the Twin Cities and that 94 corridor up to St. Cloud, and then that 169 corridor down to Mankato, that's considered urban right now. Now, are you gonna drive through some lesser populated places? Absolutely, but those are considered urban counties. Now, I am from this little county here, Waseca County, and we're a mix of small town and rural. I am right there in the middle of rural. But we're a bedroom community for Mankato, so I expect that to change in a little bit. We're only 200 people, but we're hoping to grow. But when you look at this, it's just interesting to see how this has changed. And when we talk about it's rural urban commuting areas, that's what we're going to look at tonight. And so where are you commuting from? What does your region look like? So when you're looking at the Brainerd area, you can see there it's large town and a little small town in that area, but you're surrounded by rural. So, you know, how, how, how has that changed over time? So because I like to make people laugh and because I like to make things a little more personal, we're gonna take a perspective of from when, I, from when I've been alive, and you can figure out how old I am by this. I was born in 1975. Yes, that's me. Um, <laughs> And just a fun, few fun little touch points, well not fun, but the Vietnam War ended in 1975. Wheel of Fortune debuted in 1975, still going today. My 91-year-old grandmother probably just got done watching it. Um, Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen was released, and Saturday Night Live debuts. Kind of getting a little old. But the population of Minnesota was 3.9 million people in 1975. The U.S. population was 219 million. The U.S. rural population was 56.9 million. Global population, 4 billion. Seems like it was a long time ago, but 4 billion. And the president was Gerald Ford. Compare that to 2022. And you have 5.7 million population of Minnesota. Let's just go back quick. 3.9 to 5.7 grew a nice amount, a very nice amount. We're at 331 million in the U.S. population, 56.8 million for the U.S. rural population. Now again, I'm gonna go back, 56.9, 56.8. Is that hemorrhaging? No. Something to think about. Four billion for the global population, or no, that's 75. 7.9 billion, almost double. Global population, and Joe Biden is the president. And for fun, Top Gun Maverick was released. The 90s fashion is back, sad to say. Queen Elizabeth died, and the average income uh, is $70,784. Why do I show you those comparisons? To show you how much has changed and how much hasn't either. So that rural population has technically, again, what is your rural, has only changed a little bit, but classifications have changed as well. And yes, this is, my, this is the farm I'm on. This is my family's farm. My cat, Flip, he's missing me right now. My pet sitter said he's very lonely without you. I'm like, well, he'll, he'll survive another day. So, so these continuum codes. And again, we're a research organization, so our bread and butter are charts and graphs. And what we try to do is bring them to light so that you can better understand them. So on the left side is 1974, that rural urban continuum code. On the right side is 2013. So you can see here, the metro is brown. What's considered metro is brown. What's considered non-metro is green. So you can see here from 1974 what it looked like. So you basically had Olmstead County here, Twin Cities up to Stearns County, Moorhead, Duluth area. That's 1974. Then you go over to 2013 and look at how much that has spread north and spread in the Rochester area. And again, down up in the 94 corridor, but down the 169 corridor, we added East Grand Forks, um, added, I think it's Carleton County. <coughs> how much that has changed. And again, how does that change the perception of rural? Because I can promise you, people here in Nicollet County and Sibley County would not say they're urban. I can promise you that, but Federal definition, the census definition, or the RUCA definition, says they are. 
So, but just look at that. So it's reclassifying. I think that's the number one thing I want everyone to take away from this today is just the reclassification of where we live and how we live and how does that affect our daily lives. So I, I wanted to show you that because it's interesting and the future, they're saying that the regional centers are going to grow even more. Brainerd's a regional center. This area is going to grow. Uh, Rochester is going to grow. Mankato, Moorhead, St. Cloud. So, fun fact is that population in rural Minnesota actually increased in 2020, between 2020 and 2021. That has not happened in decades. Why did it happen? Well, that thing called the pandemic is why we think it happened. We finally have the numbers to back it up. We had heard antidotically over COVID that, oh, people are moving to my towns and we don't have enough housing and you know this and that. And it's like, and people would ask us, do you have the numbers? I'm like, no, I don't have the numbers yet because if I don't have the numbers, I don't have an answer. Well, we got the numbers, we got the data, and it's true. Rural Minnesota did grow, not by a lot, but they grew. And it's interesting because where the, we'll go through this, the, the three areas where the most growth happened was right here, Central Lakes area. You all know it, you live it every day. I'm sure there were people here that had their lake home or maybe they moved here um, and they can telecommute, but this area grew. Another area that grew are counties where non-white populations are concentrated. So Nobles and Mauer County, so that's Worthington and that's Austin. What do those two counties and those two towns have? Meat processing plants. So Hormel is in Mauer County, and I believe JBS is in Nobles County. One of the huge factors we talk about is economic development and lack of workers the immigrant population are coming in and taking those jobs. So those counties are growing. Also, quote unquote, metropolitan counties, Blue Earth and Olmstead County, they're growing, there are areas around there. So again, I'll talk about Mankato. It's a, a considered an urban area, but again, you go five minutes out, not even five minutes, two minutes out, there's cornfields. Could it be more or more rural? But those areas are growing because people are willing to drive to town. Now, the interesting thing is that where did, these three areas are growing, but where did they move from? Because in migration, it kind of tends to come and go. The Twin Cities Metro, in fact, Hennepin County and Ramsey County are the two counties that saw the most decline from 2020 to 2021. Pretty interesting stuff. Where did they move? Some moved to rural, some moved suburban, some moved out of state. But the fact of the matter is rural grew. And I don't think we tell that story enough. I actually was watching the news, I think it was last week, and they were talking about how, oh, Minneapolis and St. Paul lost population, da 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 da. Do you think they mentioned that rural gained population? No. Why would they? So something to think about. Hopefully we'll keep on growing, or at least sustain. We'll, we'll see how things go. Because I don't know about all of you but around here, but what we're seeing throughout the state and throughout the country is people would like to move outside of the Twin Cities, but there's a lack of housing, there's a lack of childcare. Um, it's not a lack of jobs. That's the number one misconception that there is. We, in our newsletter, we call it myth busters. And you know, what's, what's a common thing that you hear of about rural? And we bust that myth. It is no longer jobs, jobs, jobs. Remember like the past, what, 25, 30 years has all been, we need jobs, we need manufacturing, we need this, we need that. Very true. But right now, what I think that I looked at, the unemployment rate in Crow Wing County is what, 4.6%? That's insanely low. And I hear a lot, oh, people are lazy, they don't want to work. No, that's not, that's really not the case. And I have the data to back that up. The reality is, the baby boomers are retiring. And I'm not going to ask any of you what your ages are, because then you'll get mad at me. But the baby boomers are retiring. And guess what? They didn't have as many kids. So I'm a Gen X. 
we're a small generation. I do not have any kids. I have a cat. So the millennials and Gen Zs, there's no one there. They're bigger uh, generations than Gen X, but there's not the population to take over from the boomers. So people act surprised, like, oh, we didn't see this coming. We didn't know we'd have shortages of people and workers. Really? You, you didn't know this. This is a surprise to all of you, even though you've known this for decades. But again, human nature, you just, it's like, it's fine right now. So when we talk about the people who can be employed or want to be employed, it's difficult. So when, when COVID came around, the, the, the data bears that more people took like early retirement or decided not to come back to work, or they could work from home. So that puts less people in the pool for who's going to work. And so I've also heard, oh, this generation, they're so lazy. None of them work. They're always on their phones. They're always gaming. I don't know about around here, but down in my neck of the woods, if I go to McDonald's, Quick Trip, anywhere, any fast food place or gas station, do you know who's working there? 15-year-olds. They're working there. Pretty much everyone that can work is working. So what are we going to do? Because a lot of these jobs can't be mechanized. You know, what, what are we going to do? And that's where we talk about immigration. My favorite, actually, this is my favorite part that I like to talk about is, again, talking about negative, oh, brain drain. And this is from the University of Minnesota Extension, from their research. And we always talk about 18-year-olds, well, oh, they can't leave. Why, why are they leaving? Why are they leaving? I have a news flash for all of you. 18-year-olds leave home. It's what they do. Maybe they might not leave home right away. Some of them stay. About 37% of people in rural Minnesota will stay in their hometown. But kids leave. But yet, we get so down on ourselves that we're losing our kids. Oh, they're leaving. They're fleeing. I mean, those are the words that are used in the media, fleeing. Well, maybe they're off to explore the world. What's wrong with that? Kids in Minnesota. Kids in Minneapolis, St. Paul are off to explore the world as well. Some of them might end up here. Some of them might end up in Mankato. 18-year-olds leave. Young people leave. My whole thing is let's give them something to come back to. I left when I was 18 to go to the University of Minnesota. Scared out of my mind. Because I originally was going to be going to a very small private college in Iowa. And I decided that that was not for me, and then I was going to go to the University of Minnesota, which is the exact opposite of a small private Christian college. Did not like it my first year. It was awful. But now I'm the biggest advocate for the University of Minnesota. And I left to go to college. I went back very briefly to do 4-H, and then I was gone. And I didn't consider myself fleeing rural. I support rural. I loved rural. My family's still there, but my jobs took me to St. Paul, Indianapolis, Washington, D.C. And I moved back to rural Minnesota, willingly moved back six years ago. And it's interesting when you tell some people that, because they're like, oh, you lived in Washington, D.C., and wasn't that such a shock going back to rural Minnesota? Like, it was a relief, quite honestly. It was a relief. I enjoyed my time in Washington, D.C. But taking a subway to work every day is not as glamorous as it seems, um, especially when the subway stalls in a tunnel and you can't get to work. Um, it's really, really expensive to live there. I, I think about I'm looking for a house in an acreage right now. And I kind of chuckle because I think back to the rent I paid. I lived in Old Town Alexandria, so just across the river um, from Washington, D.C. And this was six years ago, mind you. My rent for a two-bedroom apartment was $2,700. I know that when I was moving, it would have gone up to $2,900. I have friends that are now paying $4,000 in rent in, the, in, in D.C. proper for a two-bedroom. 
So yeah, coming back here was kind of a nice relief. And you know what else I, I realized? I, I missed space. The only space, the only green space I had was across from our apartment. I, had, I was in a high rise, the top floor, and we had a Civil War cemetery right across the way, right across the street. That was my green space. That was it. And I was glad I had it. It was historic. It was very interesting to walk through, but that's it. I grew up on a farm. I need open spaces. One of those things I didn't realize until it was gone. And so fortunately, in rural, we're slowly getting to have more broadband and more internet. That's one of the reasons I can move back to rural. We don't have the best internet in rural Waseca County yet. I actually, in fact, we do a lot of webinars for our organization. I actually have to go into Mankato or Waseca or to my aunt's place to host webinars because if you would get on a webinar where I'm doing it from our farm, you would get so frustrated because it, the bandwidth just isn't there. So I have to go into town. Fortunately, we all know that there's a lot of broadband money coming from the federal government and the state government. And we're in right now, in our little part of Waseca County, we're in to get fiber to our farms. Fantastic, I can't wait. But that's one of the reasons I could move back. And so talking about what should we do to bring people back. <clears throat> So the brain gain. Believe it or not, 30 to 49 year olds are moving back. Go have your experience, live abroad, do your thing. But then come back. Give them something to come back to. So you can see here the 25 to 29 year old cohort, the change from previous census, yeah. Will we consider rural outstate Minnesota? Yeah. They left. Leave, leave, leave. But look at that, that 30 to 34 year old cohort, they're coming back. They're starting to come back. More people want to come back. Here's where the problem is though. Like I mentioned before, we don't have the housing for people. We don't have the infrastructure. We don't have the childcare. I hear stories weekly about people that would like to move anywhere in greater Minnesota and they simply cannot find a place to live. It's either too dilapidated or it's a million dollars. A starter house is really difficult to find. And childcare, holy cow. We were the canary in the coal mine, our organization was about seven years ago on childcare, saying, hey, pay attention people, childcare is a huge issue and it's an economic development issue. Unfortunately, it took the pandemic happening and people realized, holy cow, we need people to take care of our employees' kids. We don't have that, what are we gonna do? Oh, it affects your bottom line, now you start paying attention. So now you'll see at the state level, they're starting to try and figure some things out and there's no silver bullet. It is a systemic issue because in urban areas, childcare is more childcare centers. In rural areas, it's more family. And there's regulations and there's fees and everything. People want to make a living wage. If you take someone to have them take care of your child, you want them to take good care of your child, but they need to be paid adequately. And how do we do that? And so there's a lot of nuances in that. And so fortunately, a lot of towns and a lot of areas are doing some really good work to work on childcare so people can come in. One example is in uh, Mauer County, so Austin. They're fortunate they have Hormel. And they know that they have a huge childcare issue. And Hormel is going to be opening, they've been working on it for a couple of years now, opening their own childcare center for their employees, but also for the town as well. They're hoping to expand it more, and they're trying to figure out how they can do a third shift, because they do shift work. If you're working parents and you're working third shift, what do you do with your kids? If you don't have family, most childcare places aren't open. So they're gonna try and, and solve that problem there. But again, give them something to come home to. And, and with, with technology, there's no reason why we can't be promoting more people moving back to rural areas or moving to. A lot of people that are moving or some people that are moving never lived in a rural area, but they want more space. They want more quality of life. Something I also like to talk about is just how it's diversifying. So I mentioned before how like Mauer County, Nobles County are increasing in diversity. 
And again, the stereotype is that, oh, there's no diversity in rural Minnesota. And to that I say, no, no, there's diversity. The diversity, the ethnic diversity in rural Minnesota is growing as fast as the metro area. But remember, we're smaller than the metro area, so we're not gonna see hundreds of thousands. But we are, percentage-wise, we're growing about the same. So this is a projection. 1980, uh, people of color, 2010 and 2040. So you can see here, it's growing. It's growing, the projections. And again, my generation, we haven't had as many kids. The boomers didn't have as many kids. We don't have the in my, we don't have the migration of people within our state. We need to be looking at how are we going to recruit people to our state. So before when I was talking about, oh, jobs, we need jobs, we need jobs. I'm not saying that we don't need jobs, but what I'm saying is we need people to fill the jobs we now have. So I was challenged on this. Actually, my researcher Kelly was challenged on this last year. Somebody asked him at a forum, if 3M decided to come into your town of New London, you know, what would you say? And he'd be like, thanks, but no thanks. We don't, we don't need you. And this person is like, you're, seriously, you would turn 3M down. He's like, absolutely, because you didn't do your homework. He's like, because if you bring 3M in, you're displacing all of these other workers, so now all of these other companies have to find workers. And it's, just, it's, it's a domino effect. So we're tr we need to find good workers, good employees. How do we do that? We promote where we live. You guys live in a great area. You can promote the lakes. You can promote how great it is to live here. Other places don't have that luxury. You know, so how, how do we do that? How do we do that? And we have to promote. In this day and age, we just cannot rely on, oh, people will know that we're a nice community. We've got good schools. No, they won't. They will not. And so if you ever pay attention to Ottertail County, they are doing a remarkable job of marketing their county and their lakes area and just making it fun. And they're getting more people moving there. So it all comes down to marketing. Economic vitality. One of the great things Tim and I were talking about earlier is each county obviously has government, county government. So the number, the, the best employers in each county in each area is government and education and healthcare. But also rural Minnesota has more entrepreneurs per capita than urban. We like to be our own bosses out here, you know? And so it looks a little different. So the top employment industries you can see here and read from there. So around here it's education and health services. I'm from an agricultural background and Agriculture is the backbone of our state, but actual farm employment is only tops in those few counties. And you can see the other ones. So here's what's interesting. In 2008, when we went through the Great Recession and whatnot, if you take Minnesota split it in half north to south, this western part of Minnesota really, really struggled. And that's because a large group, they have more farm employment. That's more, more their economy is agriculture. So when agriculture tanked, so did their towns. So did their communities. When you look around here or in my areas, we fared pretty decent. We still had job loss, but we had diversified industries. We had manufacturing. We had trades. We had education so we could absorb those job losses a little bit more. But when you're just focused on one thing, it's really difficult. So you're, you all are really fortunate here that you have diversified industries here. Now, my little uh, county of Waseca, it's, Waseca's not even 10,000 people. And I think the county population is maybe 13,000, 14,000. Waseca used to be a manufacturing town, and we're surrounded by corn and soybeans. We're, we're an agricultural area, but we used to be really big into manufacturing. Slowly but surely, that's gone away. And we just had our last, uh, I don't want to say largest, but a large employer employs, I think, two or 300 people in our town. They're leaving to go to South Carolina. Okay. So what do we do? So 
our economic development people are working on that and whatnot. Fortunately, there are a lot of jobs, but they may have to drive outside of Wasika to get them. But it's not as catastrophic as it could be because we have diversification of industry. So the bottom line, what does this all mean? Why, why are you here? What, what, what's, the, what's the status of rural? I want to tell you that rural is in a pretty darn good place. Are there parts of rural Minnesota and rural America that are struggling? Absolutely. Absolutely. But there are parts of rural Minnesota and rural America that are doing really, really well. And I'll toot our own horn here because I know we're not good at that. I didn't realize how far ahead of the curve Minnesota is in so many things until I moved, until I left. I assumed everyone had adequate and great education. I assumed everyone had clean drinking water. Basic things some of these rural areas do not have. Drinking water, go down to Mississippi. It's sad. We're doing a really good job here. And so with our research, what we like to do is, again, take this information, package it up, and give it to decision makers and say, hey, let's change the narrative. This, this is a great place to live. W pay attention. More people want to move here. More people want to live here. So I think, you know, when you're talking about it, talking about tonight, it's changing the rural narrative. That's kind of what my staff and I, my staff of three, two researchers and myself, we've kind of taken that on as our unofficial task, is changing the rural narrative. Changing it and telling good stories. We are our own worst enemies. Because I can tell you, from personal experience, if somebody says, oh, I'm gonna move, maybe I'll move back to Wasika County. A few years ago, my first response would have been, God, why would you do that? I have to catch myself. Now I'm like, that's fantastic. Where do you want to live? How can I help? You know, we're our own worst enemies. Again, bringing people to come back. What can, what can they bring to our communities? It's been fun in Wasika now. We have a great arts center. Um, I got into yoga when I was out in Washington, D.C. In my little town of Waldorf, I take yoga from my cousin, of course, because I'm related to half the people there, in a small church. If you would have told me I was going to do yoga in the small UCC church, I would have said you were crazy. You know, the world, is, the world is condensing. And so I encourage all of you to change that narrative of where we live. And this whole thing of urban and rural, and it, I won't get into that tonight because that's just a whole other discussion, but we have to learn to get along and play together. And in politics, that's really difficult. We're, we're going through it right now. Part of our organization is uh, funded by the state of Minnesota. And we're trying to work on keeping our funding. There's politics. I can't do a lot about it. So you maneuver through that. But what we've found is working is just having those conversations. We host uh, about quarterly. We host with an organization called the Citizens League. We host a uh, webinar called Interconnected. And so we'll talk about childcare, healthcare, uh, EMS, and we bring people from rural Minnesota, and we bring people from the Twin Cities, and we have a discussion of what's going on. So one of the great revelations when you're talking about healthcare is the people who were on our panel last year, we were talking about healthcare access, specifically access. It looks very different in metropolitan and suburban areas. In a rural area, you're worried about getting there. At least in an urban area, you maybe have public transportation or you can take a cab, an Uber, where my 91-year-old grandmother who lives next door cannot get to her appointment unless one of us takes her because she's not driving. Fortunately, there's family around to do that. You know, and so then we have this discussion at this webinar and they're like, well, what about telehealth? She can just do telehealth. Are you going to come to my 91-year-old grandmother's house and teach her how to use the internet and the computer? No. I tried. It's difficult. And they're not comfortable either. They're not comfortable doing that. You know, they want that one-on-one -on -one attention. And so it was just interesting when seeing the light bulb go off and some people's heads are like, 
oh, your issues are different. Yeah, they are. Just like with childcare. Urban areas, it's more affordability. In rural areas, it's more we do not have childcare at all. And so just having those conversations, and there's hard conversations, but having those conversations. So uh, I want to close out here, but if you're interested, please uh, check us out on social media. You can see here all of our social media. We have a, a really up and coming YouTube channel. I'm pretty, pretty happy with it. So every time we put out a research report, we typically will do a webinar. So we do our research report, and then we have a panel discussion. And so you can go on there, check it out. I think it's fantastic. I'm biased. Our latest report was actually just on the education funding formula, secondary education funding formula, which may not sound all that intriguing, but Kelly Ash on our staff does a great job of explaining it in the 14 different categories of funding for secondary education. And the great thing is, is that he did like a 15 minute tutorial as well on YouTube that explains it all. And so again, we try to package our information so that you can get it better. So Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter. I have an intern right now. He's a student at Concordia Moorhead. He's got us on Instagram. Don't, well, you can go and friend us or follow us, but we're, we're working on getting that yet. But just trying to get this information. Because research, eh, if you would have told me I'd be running a research organization even 10 years ago, I would have said, no. That's boring. It's not boring. It's a lot of fun. And I view my job as getting that information out there so people can learn and get excited about it. And so that's what we're trying to do, with, especially with my intern, Jesus. I'm like, tell me. Like, I, I learned last week, those of you that are in college right now will probably be like, you didn't know this, but I did not know that you could put a podcast on YouTube. Why would you do that? Because you listen to a podcast, right? But I was told by my wonderful intern, well, yeah, but people want to have it on YouTube and just multiple access points. So my mind was blown. So if you want to listen to our podcast, too, go on YouTube. Um, but we do a podcast about every two weeks, depending upon the topic. And then also, you can stay up to date. You can go on our website ruralmn.org and sign up for our newsletter. We promise not to spam you. Um, you'll get emails on our latest reports. If you sign up right now in the next couple weeks, you will get invited to be part of our thought leader survey. So a question that gets asked quite often is how do we determine our topics that we're going to study? And it comes from people like you. It comes from rural residents. It comes from rural leaders, rural influencers. And so we have a list of, for the staff, we put together about a list of 15 to 20 topics. And we send it out and we ask people to tell us, is it important, is it urgent? And we have a whole scale we can go through. And then we also have an area for you to give us suggestions. And from there, we put that all together, analyze it, and boil down to about four to seven topics. Our research year starts on July 1st. And so we put together those topics, and then our board approves it. Now, yes, we will do our own little project every now and then, but that thought leader survey is what determines our future. So make sure you sign up for the newsletter so you can be a part of that. Um, and the other thing I'll say, too, is our next research report coming out, I'm really excited about, I'm excited about all of our research reports, but our next one coming out, I'm really big into civic engagement. And so this one is going to be talking about the decline of local journalism, local newspapers, and how it affects civic engagement. I can't wait for this to come out. I talked with Marnie, our researcher, who's working on that today. Again, I have the best researchers, and this is one of them where I'm gonna, I have to pull the plug sometimes. Because with research, you can always research more. You can always do more. You can always interview more. And I'm like, Marnie, we, we got to get this out. We have to get this out. And so I encourage you to, uh, we'll be releasing that in the next few weeks. But yeah, that's, that's a whole nother Rosenmeyer forum is talking about local media. <laughs> but that's the type of report that we're doing. So with that, uh, thank you so much. I hope that you learned a little bit about rural and, and can help us change the narrative. And, and uh, yeah, thank you so very much. I guess we're open to questions.
Julie, while we're um, while I'm trying to get questions from the audience, do you want to tell folks a little bit about what are the most recent research reports? You've mentioned a couple. What are the other ones? Sure. So um, one of our very one of our important or really popular ones that we did last year was on rural EMS, so emergency medical services, and how um, there's already an EMS shortage, staff shortage, but in rural areas, if you call 911, you want someone to show up. If I call 911 in my area, someone will show up, but it might, it's gonna take a while. It'll be first responders from our uh, fire department, and they're fantastic, but a lot of them are out on the farm, or they're somewhere else, and just to get to town, takes 10, 15 minutes, and then you have to get suited up and get going. And so what, is the, what does rural EMS look like and what does the work shortage look like? Because so many of them are volunteers and so many of them aren't self-employed that they have to ask for time to take off of work. Well, a lot of places of work are not going to let someone take off you know, when their pager goes off. So that's one of them. Um, we also just did a report on child care solutions. We, have, we talked until we're blue in the face about the issues, but what are some solutions? And so we went around to different communities and surveyed them on what, what are some solutions that have happened. And that, that's been a really popular one as well. And it's kind of fun because we're finally starting to see that our research is influencing policy. So for rural EMS, no one was talking about it at the legislature, EMS at all. Well, now we helped host um, focus groups around the state. They were very well attended. Now there's some movement policy-wise at the legislature talking about EMS. So it's pretty exciting. And that's same with the child care issue as well. Nobody was talking about it, but now we're looked upon as one of the leading resources if you want to know about child care. So it's pretty cool watching that all evolve. RuralMN.org. Who has questions for Julie? Julie? Mm -hmm. We, have to, we, we need you to use the microphone. No, we need you to use the microphone so that the people watching on streaming can hear you. Oh, 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 hi, gang. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wave. Julie, tonight on Channel 4 News, Wyndham, Minnesota, is facing 1,000 jobs in their meat processing plant. Yeah. Were you aware of that? Uh, yeah, I, I just read that yesterday and sent it to my staff, and um, I've been traveling uh, outside the state for some family things, and I texted them yesterday, and... I can't wait for us to talk more about it in person because again, when we talk about we need people, okay, we have a thousand potentially a thousand displaced workers. Where are they going to go? What are they going to do? And here's an interesting thing about that farm as well or that 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 hog operation. They provided housing for a lot of their people. And I believe I believe they were, had people living in Mankato at an old um, hotel, but a lot of these places have to provide housing or they're not going to get people. So they provide adequate housing. So now you might have a, a thousand people that don't have a place to live. So I'm not exactly optimistic. I'm hopeful that a buyer will come in, but the, the hog market isn't, it keeps on, uh, uh, something that we say in our office quite a bit, or virtually we don't have an office, is economies of scale are the nemesis of rural America. Because everything's about economies of scale. What's your return on investment? It's going to look different in rural. Economies of scale, yeah, you might have a lean, mean machine, but it doesn't work the same as if you're in Minneapolis. So. I'm really curious. I'm curious to talk to the Commissioner of Agriculture. I know he was out there today. And just, uh, it's, it's really unfortunate. And I'm, I'm afraid that that's just a foreshadowing of what might be coming just in economies of scale. So we'll, we'll see. But thank you for bringing that up. Other questions? Well, he's running up the aisle. I have a question. Yeah. You mentioned that part of your funding comes from the state of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Where does your other funding? Ah, good question. So our other funding comes from private grants. So we're, a, we're our own 501c3. We're our own nonprofit. So about half of our funding comes from the state, so agriculture and economic development. The other half uh, comes right now from the McKnight Foundation and the Blandin Foundation. 
And so uh, they've been with us for, gosh, we're 25 years old, and they've been with us almost the whole time. McKnight has been with us the whole time, and Blandon almost as long. So they're wonderful partners, and they're really helpful for us in the last couple of years of connecting us with more people in the community, because we're trying to get, we do great research, but we're trying to be more inclusive of our research. And so I think of um, Blandon Foundation introducing us to people in the Leech Lake Band, or um, Blandon helping us in the Latino population. How can we be encompassing more and getting our research to be more inclusive? So one of the issues uh, has to do with land use mm -hmm. in the rural areas, uh, energy competing with agriculture. Mm -hmm. And has your, has your organization looked, uh, done research in that area, and, and what kind of an impact is that having, and how do you see the future of that? I am glad you brought that up. Uh, I see it personally every day when I'm at home. We had, uh, my dad and I were discussing this last week. I believe it's 1,500 acres of really good, productive black soil. Really good land going for solar. Okay. <laughs> we're in corn and soybean country. We have some of the best land in the country. And, you know, I really want to talk to that farmer and be like, Tell me, tell me your thought process. Tell me about this. Because that is something that is on our thought leader survey this year, for this next year, is what's this going to look like for rural areas? OK, you put 1,500 acres into a solar farm. That's great. You get paid every year X amount. But what does that mean in the future for food, jobs, community, the whole nine yards? So I think it's, it's a. It's a slippery slope, trying to figure out that balance. And I know with all of the new goals of renewable energy and carbon emissions and everything, obviously things have to be done. But I hope people are thoughtful about it as well. Um, because again, that productive land could be used to be feeding animals, potentially feeding people, making biofuels. So that is definitely on our horizon and on, on our thought leader survey this year. So we're. We're, we're, <laughs> we're very curious to look at it. Other questions? Um, my question deals with the child care issue. I'm hearing or seeing that certain politicians are uh, working on potentially paying young families extra money to uh, help them with child care costs because mm -hmm. they're 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 quite expensive. I'm wondering what your group uh, has found in your research that can be solutions to the problems of child care because I mean I'm seeing it definitely in our community with my own relatives struggling calling. Mm -hmm. literally a hundred people to see if they can find one person to take a child and I'm um, wondering what your research is finding for the rural communities as solutions very good question and like you said it there's such a lack of, of licensed child care and in our research what we found again like I said before it's more sy systemic but First off, we have to have affordable child care. But second of all, the child care workers or the people that are in their homes need to be paid a living wage, a fair wage as well. And so where's that balance? And so when you talk about um, tax credits, I believe, you know, going towards young families, that's an option. Also, being able, we have to figure out how to pay our workers in health care and in child care, and especially in home child care, how do we do that? And a lot of that is figure out there's a lot of formulas that we could go through, but I do believe in our research it shows we do need to have some subsidies. And I know I hear a lot too of, oh, there's too many regulations. It's all, it's all about regulations. Well, some of it is regulations. It's not an all or nothing game. The problem is that when it's a blanket policy of you need to do this, this, and this, 
okay, in a childcare center in Golden Valley, that's one thing. In Staples, in a house, in a family daycare, that's completely different. So let's have some nuance in that. And that's what our research shows a lot is provide the nuance to what needs to be there and actually go and work within the region. And so I don't know that the tax credit thing is a newer thing. And so I'm curious to see how that'll go. But what we have found is that communities are tired of waiting and they're taking it upon themselves. Um, Lake Crystal, Minnesota, they started, uh, I think it was Crystal Valley Co-op, donated their building to them and they turned it into a child care center because they just couldn't wait. And, and cities and counties are taking it upon themselves. Or like I mentioned, Hormel, they're just taking it upon themselves. And so I think you're going to be seeing a lot more public-private partnerships when it comes to child care. Um, but again, it, it's, it's hard and you know when we talk about unemployment rates and how many people are out able to work people want to I mean for the most part people want to work but if you can't someone to take find someone to take care of your child you're not you're not going to be able to do that and that that affects women more than men typically and so it's yeah and like I said there's a lot of formulas I could go into but I don't want to bore you but it, the tax credit is one step and then you have the research report on solutions. We do, yes, on solutions. So if you go onto our website, yep, we have a report on there on solutions. So you can see what some different communities are doing. Um, and actually, we did a report last year with the Humphrey Institute um, out of the University of Minnesota. We work with their grad students. And we specifically looked at Worthington, Minnesota. We looked at Nobles County and the Latino population because there's trouble finding childcare everywhere in the state but especially for those ethnic minorities, trying to find care is really difficult. And so we did a, a quick report on that just to show where things are at in that community and how that works. And um, yeah, so that's online as well. Other questions? Um, thank you. Uh, I know I, I hear a lot of the hand wringing about turning prime farmland into solar farms, and yet the urbanization, the Twin Cities, is known as one of the worst areas for urban sprawl, gobbling up thousands of acres of prime farmland for, for homes. And I think it brings the, the whole question of uh, rural America and rural Minnesota is really about food production. And I'm, I'm reading a great book by one of the leading investigative reporters from the Financial Times um, who is, is writing about that we have sacrificed in the name of efficiencies and globalization and, and um, you know, the investor class and shareholder value. In, and we've replaced efficiencies, or I'm sorry, we've gone with efficiencies and sacrificed resiliency. And so a lot of our rural economies aren't working anymore. And um, she's advocating for this new movement toward um, regenerative agriculture and more place-based economies that bring people back to building community and, and that so many people, a lot of the unrest and the polarization in our country is because people are feeling left out. They're not participating. We, they see an economy that's just really proliferating and making money for some, and yet they themselves cannot make a living. So I, I would like to hear more about um, efficiency versus resiliency, and um, why are we rewarding two crops like corn and soybeans mm -hmm. instead of Let's support real food. Let's support broccoli farmers and mm. carrot farmers. Mm. Oh, geez. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So that's going to be the next six sessions. Um, <laughs> the farm bill is up this year, so we can discuss that. A um, couple of things I want to talk about. When you talk, I'm glad you brought up community, because you can find you can make community wherever you're at. But I will tell you personally, living in a rural area, I feel more connected to my community. And I think in this day and age of the internet and social media, it's more difficult to do that. 
but at least I think in, a, in more rural areas, you might see someone at the high school basketball game. You might see them at church. You might see them at the store. I enjoyed being anonymous out in Washington, D.C. when I was grocery shopping. But then I didn't. I'm like, I would actually like to run into somebody I know. I mean, being anonymous is great, but that community and being able to do that and that community development, I think you're going to see in the younger generation, this Gen Z, the students here um, today, they're craving that too. They want to see that community, and they're doing a really good job of being involved. Um, when you talk about um, land use and agriculture and corn and soybeans, yes, yes, and yes, and it comes down to the farm bill. It comes down to the farm bill, and a very good friend of mine, he was the lead economist on the last farm bill in the Senate. And he left after that because he was burned out. Um, but he was so excited because he's from a corn and soybean farm in Indiana. He was so excited and passionate about it. But it's also, it's, it's a small part of the overall budget of America, but it's such an important part. But he, he felt that he couldn't do enough. And so any little thing, he's like, we can't. There's too many politics involved right now. And so I, I wish I had a silver bullet that could figure out how we, how we reward regenerative agriculture. And I think the USDA right now, the commissioner there, or the secretary of agriculture, he's getting that, his staff are getting that. I'm seeing that coming out more. There's more grants. But until we can figure out a way to pay our farmers an adequate, I don't want to say wage, but adequate money for the prices, you know, I think, I think of sugar beets. Sugar beets, we used to grow sugar beets in southern Minnesota, I guess. I don't remember it. But uh, they're now, you know, up in northwest Minnesota and Renville County. They ended up growing up there because, one, they have really good soil. But, two, people got together and started a cooperative. That's what the people did it. And I, I see that coming as well, um, whether it's we have a farm just to the south of us. A young couple moved in, and it's their grandfather's farm. They're using five or ten acres of it, and they're doing regenerative agriculture, but with vegetables. They're doing CSA, uh, farmers markets, the whole nine yards, and making a go of it. And so I'm seeing more of that, of people just doing it themselves. Because I'll tell you, too, in agriculture, it, you know, economies of scale. Economies of scale. Our, our farm, when, when we dairied, we sold our cows in the 90s, but we milked 100 cows. And that was a lot then, and that was my dad. And we sold our cows, we had a registered herd and whatnot, and we have, what, 240 acres now that my cousin runs? It's a hobby farm. It, it, it just is. And so in our area, we're getting more outside investors coming in, which if I'm taking off my hat of <laughs> work, and going over personally, I would love to see uh, some rules or something on, invest, on, on private investors because I like knowing who my neighbors are. But, you know, there is professional basketball players investing in land. Um, Glenn Taylor owns land around us. And I will say, you know the land is going too expensive when Glenn Taylor quits bidding on it. That, then you know. <laughs> you're, you're probably in over your head. Um, in 10 years from now, I don't, I fear who's going to own our land. I mean, I really do. I know for our farm, we've owned our farm uh, since the 1880s. And that's the most important thing in our family is that land. You know, and there's a lot of emotion tied to that. Um, who knows what will happen in the future, but I know my sister and I, it's like, no, this is, this is home. We, we want to be here. We want to treat the soil as well as we can. Um, and hopefully my niece will do that as well. But it's, it's hard because, again, econ the economy. People want m it's money. And I, I don't know how to solve that. You know, and so, yeah, I wish I had a, a better answer. But it comes down to the farm bill. Be paying attention because it is a farm bill year. And the majority of the money in the farm bill goes towards the nutrition 
area, so SNAP benefits, nutrition, the actual farm part of it is very small. So be paying attention, that's coming up. I think we have time for one last question. Comment before Laura, because please, <laughs> not broccoli, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Brussels sprouts? <laughs> So in the 1930s, there was price supports for farmers, and, and there was concern about skewing markets and distorting markets. But in, it, since that time, especially in the 1980s, it's all become private insurance companies backstopped by the federal government, and they're driving this move toward the whole exporting mm -hmm. of a few crops, corn and soybeans. And um, you know, right now, uh, China owns 67% of the pork production yep. in this country. And this same investigative reporter said in 40 years, uh, 991 million acres of land are gonna be bought up probably by investors and foreign investors. That's what is going to happen. And this insurance-driven model is what is distorting markets, and it's why economies of scale um, that are becoming unsustainable has been the mm -hmm. has been the status quo. But it can't go on because the pandemic proved we have no resilience. Where the supply chains can't keep up with it, and you had stores that were short of food, mm -hmm. and institutions that couldn't get food. So I think. I think groups like yours need to go back and study mm -hmm. some of the earlier underpinnings of agriculture programs and learn from them. And that's where a farm bill um, needs to come in into play. But there's so much political power now stacked against it. But I, thank you for that because I think that's something, I think that's a really good idea, learning from the past and researching what, what happened 100 years ago because Quite honestly, it is scary, the land being bought. I think in North Dakota right now, that was a couple months ago, they were going through whether China could buy land or not. And it's like, okay, we, let's start, we need to start talking about this. This is affecting us immediately. And so, yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, because, you know, if you're in California, if you're a macadamia nut farmer, you're not getting price supports. If you're a citrus grower in Florida, you're not getting that as well. And so where... Where is that? And it comes down to farm bill and it comes down to lobbying. The sugar lobby is very powerful. The corn lobby is very powerful. I didn't realize that there was, when, until I went out to Washington, D.C., quick story, I did not realize there was such a animosity in the sugar lobby between sugar beets and sugar cane. They do not like each other. So because sugar beets are more like northern, or like northern, northern states, Sugarcane Southern, and so you get that whole politics going in there, and it's lots of fun. So I did not have to deal with that, but it was interesting to watch. So, please join me in thanking Julie for coming all the way from Southern Minnesota just to visit with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming out on a beautiful, beautiful day and evening. I greatly appreciate it, and I hope that you all have a safe drive home and can enjoy some good weather again tomorrow. Thank you, Julie. This is the last forum for the Rosenmeyer Center for this uh, spring. We, us we, we usually take the summer off, and so we will have uh, another forum beginning in the fall again. So we just want to thank you guys for coming out tonight. Beautiful summer night. Still a little bit to enjoy. Thank you for coming. <laughs>